Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us today for today's webinar with Nico Asset Management. So this is actually the first webinar of their two-part series called We Know Asia. And today we will focus on Asian equity. So now I'll introduce the four speakers we have, we have for us today. So first off, we have Robert Mann. He is the head of Asian equity from the Nico team. Um, he is the Asian ex Japan equity team and is, and is responsible for macro research. For the next speaker, we have Peter Monson. He's a senior portfolio manager of Nico AM Shandam Asia Pacific Fund. And next off, we have Ng Tik Tan. He's a senior portfolio manager of Nico AM All China Equity Fund. So last but not least, we have Grace Yen, who's also the portfolio manager of the Nico AM Shandam Emerging Enterprise Discovery Fund. So without further ado, we will now start off with the panel discussion. Our first question is for Robert. So our first question is, it's clearly been a tough year for many people's lives. So the economic data is not good and yet equity markets, while vol volatile, have not done so badly. Can you give us your big picture overview of what, we, what the markets appear to be saying? Thanks, Sarah, and, um, and welcome everyone and thank you for attending. Um, yes, you're right. There's been this huge split between very weak economy caused by the reaction to the COVID virus on one hand, and yet on the other side, um, equity markets that have done quite well when you see US equity market up year to date, Chinese equity market up year to date. Um, and clearly we're not in front of you today saying that we know what the virus will do next. We've got to then think about when that happens, we don't know how will governments react. Um, on both the medical side as well as on the, on the side of the economy. But I think we can observe what markets have got priced in at the moment and we can form a view on whether we think what the markets have got priced in is, is likely to occur or not. Um, the first comment I'd make would, is that um, it's really easy to mix up or to conflate the economy with the equity markets. Um, that's often a small mistake and I think at the moment that's a very big mistake. And, and the reason is that the, the virus has particularly hit the small business and the service sector, and yet the equity market is overweight, sort of large, large businesses and a lot less in the service sector. So what the stock market is telling you is what one portion of the economy has done, is doing, and that's not the bit that's been most hard hit by the virus. Um, I think in the longer term, we could very easily see a situation where the listed sector gets a much larger share of the overall profit pool produces, produced by the economy, even if that profit pool itself is smaller because of, because of slower GDP growth. Um, so on a, on a big picture basis, I think that's the big mistake we get. Next thing is to look at is the market itself. And that within the market, I'd observe that things, the high growth stocks with strong balance sheets and whose business is actually helped by, by, the, by the pandemic have done very well while the heavily indebted companies whose business have been hurt, i.e. airlines, have done very badly. So at that level, the market's acting pretty sensibly um, in terms of sort of pricing and where, 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 where growth should be. Um, bond yields are clearly very low, but central banks are telling us very strongly that they are going to leave rates low, short rates low for a long period of time. So I don't think bond yields look silly. I think I would add, though, that it's hard to see them rallying very much if there's another downturn. Um, and so there's not much capital gain to be made from them. And if inflation ever comes back, and that's clearly an if, then there can be a large downside to bonds, but we don't expect that anytime soon. Um, when we look at equities, front page of the paper most days tells you it's a bubble, that it's overdone. And that, that's usually, I think, because when people are looking at PE ratios, price earnings ratios from the past. Um, but that ignores the fact that bond yields at very low levels. And with, low, with bond yields at low levels, um, with no income available from many fixed income securities, um, I think you need to look at what equities are offering you relative to bonds. And on that basis, I think it's pretty clear that equities are fairly valued to cheap. Um, at the same time, we're having massive fiscal stimulus, massive monetary policy stimulus, and I think that you can, that we don't know when the fiscal, figures, fiscal stimulus will stop, but I think if anything, it will go for longer than has currently been announced because governments everywhere want to be re-elected and won't take the risk of the economies turning down. Um, and 
Um, so, so, and markets, I think, are sensing that if there's another downturn, there will be more stimulus. So the risk to the downturn has been taken away for the moment. So I think markets, equity markets, that is, are, are telling you the economy is currently recovering very strongly, which it clearly is from this huge downturn. Um, they, they're telling you that policy support is there if needed. Um, I think valuations look okay compared to current bond yields. Um, we are going through this very, very strong recovery at the moment. Um, and I'd also add that businesses cut costs very aggressively and that those cost cuts will last for a while. So overall, we think the equity markets actually look okay. There are clearly individual pockets that, 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 that look excessive. But on a, on a broad basis, um, we, we, we think equity markets are, are, are roughly correctly priced. Thanks, Robert. So our next question is also for you. Should investors be looking to overweight Asia within their equity portfolios or should they stay in the US but the large IT stocks just continue to keep outperforming? Yeah, you're right about, you know, the, the, over the recent years, the most, the most important decision people would make if you just owned the big US IT stocks, you clearly did very well. The outperformance of the US was virtually completely because of those large stocks. And they've obviously clearly done an amazing job and they've been helped recently by having strong balance sheets and being in just the right space when everyone got, got locked from home. But I'd say now when you look at them, first thing I'd, I'd note is that they're very large. So when you're large, it's clearly growth is harder to get. Um, secondly, I think there's a, a, quite a high chance of higher taxes in the US, whether that's from a Biden win or even just the need to get the US budget deficit under control eventually. Um, and third thing I'd say is that the regulatory environment, which has been quite favorable to them, is turning against them, whether that's in the in the U in in Europe or or even in the US. There's there's things been coming out the last last few weeks. Um, and on top of that, I'd say that clearly the US and and parts of Europe have handled the, the virus very badly, whereas most of Asia, particularly the more developed parts of Asia, have handled handled it very well. And I think that confidence that that you that that both investors and also business people get from governments doing well will encourage people to invest and to do the capex, which is important for the future of the business. Um, that clearly within Asia, the important markets are those in North Asia, so China, Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, et cetera. Most of those economies are actually much closer to being back to normal than, than, the, than the US or, or Europe. There is still lots of policy support. Um, rates are low levels here as well. Um, and this just general confidence that we have that, if there's another down, if there's a, a second wave, that governments will do the right thing is, is really important for, for, for business. Um, and also, it's interesting to note that when, when um, COVID first came and Wuhan locked down, the, the initial reaction was democracies can't do those sorts of things. Well, we found out that they can go pretty close to what China did, that you know, parts of Italy um, obviously were locked down. You know, even in, in Australia today, so some borders are closed. There are some housing, housing, housing sort of um, tower blocks where people can't leave their, their apartments at all. So the world in many ways is following the China model. Um, when we look at Asian equities, traditionally, one of the rules of thumb was that a weak economy meant weak Asia because there were less exports. But as I sort of noted earlier, that this slowdown is very much in the service sector and clearly not many services are exported. Maybe tourism to Thailand is the exception. But people are stuck at home. They can't go to their favourite restaurant. They can't travel. They're actually buying more goods. And lots of those goods are made in Asia. So I don't think it's surprising that, that exports have recovered probably more quickly than people thought. And that you know, what Asia does is, 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 is make the goods that are going to be a bigger chunk of people's consumption basket. Um, so I think over the next six months, we're going to be in a period of the world's recovering really strongly now from this huge hole that we had. Once we get through that, investors are going to look around the world and say, there's not much growth anywhere. There's not much income anywhere. Where do I invest? And Asian equity markets offer both income. We still have a dividend yield um, and we have the growth. So I think on a relative basis, um, Asia is able to outperform um, over, over, over the next year or so. Thank you, Robert. Okay, so for Peter, your fund, Nicole AM Shenton Asia Pacific Fund, has done very well over the last 12 months, returning 15.2% and beating its benchmark by 12.4%. So can you tell me how you have the fund position now and the themes and countries that you either think are attractive or which you think are risky? 
Sure. Uh, thanks very much, Sarah, and thanks for everyone tuning in. Um, I think first and foremost, we're long-term bottom-up stock pickers, so we're trying to buy and hold the best 40 to 50 stocks in the region. Um, now, what that means in our portfolios currently, from a country perspective, we've generally found companies that have witnessed the least disruption to operations and earnings and indeed have actually found greater opportunities emanating um, from, from these troubled times. So, have been in economies where they've been able to contain the virus successfully, uh, where they managed to avoid lockdowns, uh, where they already have a high proportion uh, of digital transformation, and where sovereign and corporate balance sheets have generally been a bit stronger, so they've been able to support SMEs, consumers, and avoid those layoffs. And this has generally resulted in us having higher weightings towards those more developed economies in North Asia, uh, like Korea, China, Taiwan, and indeed Hong Kong at the expense of more emerging economies in ASEAN and India, where we still have a lot of sort of structural issues to digest. Um, but the, the most interesting developments, I think, have come from within different sectors. Um, and here there's sort of a number of trends that were already maybe in place that have been significantly accelerated by what's happened. Uh, the biggest of which Rob has touched upon, uh, the shift from sort of old economy physical businesses towards new economy and digital. Uh, with many sort of industry sub industries seeing what might have taken two to three years to happen occur within a couple of quarters. And those sort of areas have been in e-commerce, e-payments, e-gaming, cloud services and content. Uh, and we've had a, a decent amount of exposure in those sectors, but we now find that they're becoming pretty well reflected within, within valuations. Uh, so have been taking a little bit off the table in, in, in those sectors. Um, others where we've seen a structural increase in, in healthcare, for example, through drug, drug development and infrastructure. Um, and healthcare has been a key overweight for the funds for a number of years, and it remains sort of the best and most structural area of growth in our region, we think. Um, on the flip side, uh, obviously things like outbound tourism, dining out, energy or subsectors where it may take many, many years to get back to 2019 levels. And we have kind of very limited or zero exposures in, in those areas. Uh, one interesting uh, result of that actually has been that rather than people being able to spend on, on tourism or dining out, um, they're actually looking to spend more domestically. So domestic tourism is one interesting area and also just more discretionary spending um, within domestic economies. So those are some areas where we've actually been adding to over recent months. Thank you, Peter. Um, for Aintake, the Chinese market reacted to COVID-19 first and once it was clear that the government had got the outbreak under control, the equity market rebounded strongly. So which sectors in the greater China universe do you think offer the best potential and which areas are you the most wary about? So, so for China, I mean, our strategy hasn't exactly changed whether there is the COVID or not. You no, know, for the past four to five years, we have always said that, you know, in the case of China, uh, there's only two main teams that you, you, two broad teams that you have to remember. One is that China, to a certain extent, is a fairly insecure country in a sense that they don't like to have reliance uh, on people for uh, what they have. So like in 2004, what I meant is like, for example, in 2004, the Chinese government go all over the world to buy out commodities because at that point in time, commodities was their biggest deficit items. Now today, if you look at China in 2017, semiconductors, uh, stroke technology, has actually become their biggest deficit items, replacing oil as it is. So this, this is very important. So we always tell people that you buy things that China is lagging on. You know, even though at this point in time, they cannot fight the US in terms of technology advancement, you buy the companies that the Chinese wants to nurture to, the, to, to, to be the future uh, technology leader. The other big team that I think is uh, brought thinking that is very, very important in China is that, especially in the past seven to eight years, in the past, people doesn't believe when China says that they're going to have consolidation because, you know, um, regulations are lax, you know, the government doesn't really enforce a lot of their regulations and, you know, supply has always been a huge problem. Demand has never been a problem in China. It has always been a supply issues where the supply disrupt the pricing and in, in that order, it actually uh, diminished the profitability. But in the 
past six to seven years, you can see that China has become very, very serious where consolidation is concerned. So even though, even in, in areas like consumption, you know, the number of very poor quality brands has actually uh, fallen very significantly. So this is another broad theme. Whenever you think about it, uh, you have to, to have. So if you take that picture into the broad teams, then, you know, uh, sectors in like semiconductors, uh, technology, you know, and even like very uh, uh, strategic things like, you know, uh, navigation, which is a huge team now in China, because, you know, at some point in time, the Chinese is worried that, you know, they might be shut out of the GPS system in the, in the US, you know, 5Gs, consumption, EVs, all these are areas where, you know, the Chinese feels that they can have a technology leap uh, potentially over uh, US. And so these are probably the areas that you want to focus on. Thanks for the insights and take. For Grace, you know, as the manager of the Nico AM Shenton Emerging Enterprise Discovery Fund, can you tell me how the small cap sector has done over the last six months and how you have found identifying interesting companies when you can't visit them? Uh, thanks, Sarah. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for the time today. So, um, the small cap sector has been extremely volatile, so returning about negative 21% in the first three months and then recovering positive 23% in the next three months. But when you put the two together, the six months performance was negative 3% in total. So relatively, um, our small cap fund has returned positive 11%, outperforming the index by 14%. One of the key reasons for that is that we've been focused on individual good quality stock ideas for alpha generation. So if you take a look at the small cap index, there are more than a thousand stocks in the benchmark. So if you buy an ETF, you'd be buying a lot of stocks, some of which could be extremely risky. We believe that in the small cap area, you should be active rather than passive and look for fund managers that have expertise with good track record with finding good quality companies which can outperform in various cycles. So on the company engagement side, we do have colleagues on our, in our team based in China and Hong Kong. So we have eyes and ears on the ground um, who can still visit companies and kick the tires despite the difficulty in travel. So separately, the team in Singapore has also been engaging in corporates and experts. There are conference calls and webinars such as the one today. So um, despite the difficulty in travel, year to date we've done collectively as a team more than a thousand meetings. So we are still keeping abreast of company trends, looking for new ideas, and we continue to find um, new names and ideas for the fund. Just in June alone, we've added seven new names um, to the fund. So the search for good quality ideas continues despite the difficulty in travel. Thanks, Grace. So has COVID-19 changed the way um, you manage the Nicole AM Shenton Asia Pacific Fund and the way you look at companies um, thus far? This question is for Peter. Yeah, so I, I wouldn't say it's materially changed the way we manage the fund, um, but it has, if anything, strengthened uh, our belief in what we do. One of the key things we look to identify in our investments is positive change and being able to anticipate that change or react to it has really been a, a key uh, feature during this period. I mean, COVID-19 has brought about significant changes for us and the companies we invest in, uh, both positive and negative. Um, and like the new versus old economy, as we've discussed previously, but another is sort of Hong Kong's integration with China, which is very topical. Um, but our focus on analyzing change has really helped immensely from um, both exiting positions early uh, that were likely to be more structurally impaired to allocating the funds towards more new economy, consumer oriented business franchises. Um, but I think this is probably best explained through a couple of uh, stock examples, if I may, um, that we've held for, for a long time now, but um, have been significant beneficiaries over the last six months. Um, and the first is, is NCSoft, a Korean company. It's leading video game developer in Korea, focused on uh, massive multiplayer online role-playing games, which for those with experience in this area is akin to um, World of Warcraft by Activision Blizzard. Um, and why did we buy the stock initially? Uh, we saw a big strategy change back in 2017-18. Uh, traditionally, they'd been a, a PC game developer and they were moving more towards mobile. I think they were early in recognizing that mobile was going to be the future. Um, and that's when we initially invested in, in the company. And what we really like about it is, again, we've got a really good high quality management team that focus more on the sustainability and longevity of their games. So they only have four titles in sort of 22 years, but all have been smash hits and all are still being played uh, to this day. I think their, their leading uh, title, their original title lineage, 
um, is still being played 20 years after it was brought out and still contributes about 10% of their earnings. Um, but what, what happened in the last sort of six to eight months is they launched their first mobile version of Lineage 2, Lineage 2M, in fourth quarter of 2019. And with COVID um, and work from home, uh, et cetera, it resulted in a, a huge jump in, in video gamers downloading the game and, and actively playing it. Um, but they've got a, a lot of extension strategies for this game. They've got the rest of their PC pipeline to convert. Uh, they're going to globally launch this, this game in Taiwan and, and Japan to begin with. And with um, increasingly better relations between Korea and China, there is the potential for them to uh, launch into the China market at some point in the future. Um, the second example, which is a bit different, but uh, links back to what I said about um, Hong Kong integration, is Hong Kong Exchange. Again, there's one of the largest uh, equity exchanges within the region, and it is really uniquely positioned as a, a kind of capital gateway for China's financial liberalization. Um, why did we buy it initially? Uh, again, the foundation of Stock Connect is a real game changer for the company. Uh, Stock Connect allows um, overseas investors to invest through uh, Hong Kong uh, to access A shares, and it also allows mainland investors to invest southbound into uh, H shares. Um, you've seen since then the inclusion of China A shares on the global industry indices, although still only at a small level. We've seen a number of other asset classes being included in the Connect scheme, and there's still a number of others to go. But what's happened um, a lot more uh, in the last, again, six to eight months is that we've seen the, the homecoming of Chinese ADRs from the US. Uh, the first was Alibaba back in November 2018, but in the last couple of months that has really ramped up. We've seen um, NetEase and a couple of others list recently, and there's another strong pipeline. Um, so th those are kind of two examples of stocks that we've held for a long time. We like them because they've got a good long-term a uh, sustainable return profile, but they have big, been big beneficiaries of changes in the last six to eight months, but also in the last uh, two to three years. Thanks, Peter. So for Intake, how do you take account of trade and other geopolitical attentions when managing Chinese shares within the Nikko AM or China Equity Fund? And can you share with us your views on Hong Kong from an investment point of view? When you take into account, you know, the the before the, the trade tension with the US in 2018, you know, one of the biggest problems with investing in, in, in the Chinese market is always having to think about how to deal with the Chinese government regulations because a lot of the regulations, a lot of times, are actually much more punitive to the stock market than it is actually beneficial. Now, if you notice the trend ever since 2018, uh, when the trade wars first started, you know, of course, the stock market took a dip because you know, of the potential uh, economic implication. But then you realize that one of the very negative factors that has gone away from the stock market in China is that increasingly, the Chinese government no longer come out and try to come out with punitive policies towards whichever companies in the in the stock market. So for example, before 2017, there's all these online uh, uh, regulations where they try to take down 10 cents and you know some parts of Alibaba. And you know, and before that they have these environmental issues that almost destroyed like maybe 30 to 40 percent of industrial profits and things like that. But in the last two years, what you have seen a very interesting trend in this is that you know the government starts to realize that they need their corporates to be strong in order to be able to take on the US. So I'm not saying that the trade war is the, a good thing, but what it has removed a very big uncertainty for me is to really focus on stock selections and on corporates that actually could benefit from less regulatory intervention and in fact, probably more regulatory help. But of course, you know, the other big factors that we have to take into account is the sentiment that potentially could be negative towards the stock market. And in that, I think the tug of war seems to be warned by now, you know, the, the helpfulness of the government in supporting the capital markets, the monetary environments where, you know, the government realized that they can't have all these corporates being weak uh, and they have to fix the economy 
while at the same time taking on the US. So I think for me, it's actually a fairly pleasant environment because you know, we just have to, to take into account all this sentiment and it has actually become sanitized to a huge extent where uh, people is kind of a bit sick of you know, the Twitter from Trump and all this thing. And unless uh, Trump comes out with significantly much more punitive measures, we think that this geopolitical tension, interestingly, is actually potentially good for the capital markets. Now, again, our view on Hong Kong has always been that we think that, you know, this thinking that Hong Kong will go independent from China has always been wishful thinking. We think that it is probably a matter of uh, differences in expectations. When China means uh, one country, two system, what it means is that, you know, you will never be able to go independent, you know, and at the same time, you know, we let you run the city as well, what it is on a more economic regulatory issues, but not on the political side. But I think the, 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 the differences is that the Hong Kong protesters and some parts of the Hong Kong economy feel differently. So on, on <clears throat> on the political side, what we can say is, is that, of course, Hong Kong will not be the same as, it, as the one that we, we envision it to be. Now, but on the economy side, it might, it might not be a bad thing. You know, Hong Kong being part of the Greater Bay Area and, you know, potentially incorporating into the Chinese uh, economic regime might actually have faster growth in terms of that. Like, like Pete said, when it comes to Hong Kong exchange, it, it is a huge beneficiary. And increasingly, you know, the Hong Kong corporates might be able to use a lot of the excess capital that they have, you know, and be having a bigger ability to access into the Chinese market and vice versa. So politically, it might be different from what it is, but actually economically, it might not be bad as what is envisioned to be. It might no longer be, say, the financial hub of Asia, but that doesn't mean that the economy cannot grow and the capital market cannot get bigger. All right, thank you, Intake. Um, so our next question for Grace. As a small cap area is all about individual stocks, can you tell us about one of the hidden gems in the Nikko AM Shenzhen Emerging Enterprise Discovery Fund portfolio? Um, the stock I would like to highlight today is Poya Holdings. So Poya is a chain retailer in Taiwan. It's a unique retailing format targeting females and it sells a huge variety of products from cosmetics, healthcare products, electrical appliances, just to name a few categories. To, to give some perspective, the average size of a Poya store is about two times the size of Daiso at Ion Orchard. So Poya Holdings is our top 10 um, holdings in the fund and it's a position that we've held since end 2018. Um, we've known the company for a long time, having uh, met them since 2014. And when we bought the stock, there were only eight Southside analysts covering it versus 15 today. So it was relatively um, less known, which is common for small caps. Um, to give some history, in 2017 and 2018, the company suffered from weak sales and the stock derated mainly due to two reasons. Firstly, um, Poya same store sales growth fell into negative territory as a result of unfavorable government policies such as stricter overtime pay as well as pension fund reforms which affected private consumption expenditure. Secondly, the company had aggressively opened stores in southern Taiwan to fend off the competition and that led to sales cannibalization. So while things seemed pretty bleak for the company, we felt that it was at the cups of a turnaround due to the following three reasons. Firstly, store remodeling helped to improve customer traffic. So the company had launched its fifth generation format, which had 20% more SKUs post remodeling. So customer traffic had improved and we visited the new store formats and also saw the changes that it brought about. Secondly, um, the company was also expanding into Northern Taiwan. So despite having about 80% market share in Taiwan, presence in Northern Taiwan was weak and the company planned to expand there. Uh, thirdly, it's a new store format. So Poya actually saw opportunity in the hardware store segment, which has an addressable market about two times its original um, market size for the female Poya side. So they are kind of recreating Poya, but more tailored towards males in the form of Poya Home. So they targeted to launch this new format in 2019, and we felt that this was a blue ocean opportunity for the company. So since then, um, our thesis has continued to play out. So the total store count has increased from about 177 to about 235 to the end of um, last year. And Poya now has eight Poya home stores 
and they're targeting to open about 30 by the end of this year. So performance has been exceeding um, management expectations and hence they've been accelerating their store opening. So we continue to like the company as it continues to deliver in terms of strong sales. Um, so for our last question for Robert, could you please summarize your views on opportunities within um, Asian equities and also touch on some of the risks? Thanks, Sarah. So maybe I'll start with the risks. So um, one thing that I do believe is that when something's on the front page of the paper as if it's negative, that's usually incorporated in share prices. So we're meant, meant to be looking further away than just what seems to be sort of the obvious risk. And at the moment, the obvious risk is COVID and who knows what will happen there. But um, if we can get a vaccine or dramatically improved um, treatment, then clearly that can be an upside risk. Um, I just observed there's a huge amount of funds and talent globally going into finding solutions. We know so much more about it now than we did two or three months ago. So I wouldn't rule out the possibility of quite a substantial improvement in, in the treatment or a vaccine. Um, there's also the whole geopolitical risk, which, which Ian Tech touched on, that once again, that situation is it's clearly not good, but it's also clearly known um, that in the US we have an election coming up this year, and I would think that a Biden presidency, while we'll still be anti-China, won't be as unpredictable as, as the current administration. And so it's really, in some ways, maybe famous last words, but hard to see the geopolitical things getting much worse than we have at the moment. Um, there clearly, I think, is a risk of an upside breakout of a real sort of bubble developing in, in parts of the Chinese market. Um, that in the longer term could be an issue, but in the short term is an, is an, is, is an opportunity. Um, if I had to sort of nominate one risk that I suspect is, is not priced in, and it's a longer term one, it is inflation that we have a very strange situation that normally in an economy, the, the service sector is, what's, um, the service sector is, what, is um, it's what is very stable and it's a good sector that moves around. With COVID, it's been the service sector that's been hardest hit. So the, sort of the stability part of the stable part of the economy has been hard hit. Um, and um, so, and I've forgotten what I was going to say, I'm sorry. Um, so so, so the, the risk in a situation like that is that the good side really can, can, get, can, can, can get very, very, very aggressively overpriced. Um, sorry, with inflation. So the, the, the reaction to, to, um, to, the, to this weakness in the services side of the economy has been to ease policy aggressively at a time when people actually can't spend the money. So we have a situation where, it's, where saving rates around the world have gone up a lot, where amount of money in most people's bank account globally in the developed world has gone up a lot, um, and yet people can't produce the goods because they're locked away at home. And so in the longer term, that really does suggest to me that the risk of inflation is quite high, but it's a longer term issue. Um, in the shorter term, the opportunities, as I said before, Asia has done a really good job of controlling the virus on a, on a comparative basis. That gives people trust in their governments. Investment, whether it's as individuals or whether it's company doing capital investment, um, needs trust. So the trust in government around the world, I think, is highest in this region. Um, reforms will continue to happen, that the push from COVID will encourage the reforms in China, which have been ongoing. Um, that it's encouraging some of the trends that we have seen already. So the move to e-commerce, working from home, e-gaming, um, e-health, etc. These trends were all in existence. They're being pushed along really quickly. Um, Asian, country, Asian companies and countries are dominating or are leading many of these. I'll just add as an aside that I think China particularly leads here. And why? Well, one reason is they have probably the best e-payments infrastructure in the world through, um, through, through WeChat Pay and through so, and Financial. Um, they probably have the most efficient um, sort of delivery um, infrastructure in the world. So it's not a surprise that new, um, that, 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 that new business models are coming from, from Asia. Uh, and I guess I finally I'd observe that the US dollar has been a little bit weaker recently, and that's good for, good, good, good for Asian equities. But maybe I'll just end by saying that clearly equity investors are looking, normally are looking for growth. Growth is something that's going to be really hard to get after the next few months of the bounce back, as I said before. 
Um, and I think there's going to be a big move for people to look for income and for growth and Asian markets offer, offer those opportunities. So on a relative basis, we, we really do believe that, that Asia can do, can, can do very well. Um, thanks, Robert, and thanks to the rest of the panelists as well, and take Grace as well as um, Peter. So um, thank you everyone again for joining us for this session. Um, we'll end the webinar off today. Thank you.